With protests raging in Hong Kong and a brutal crackdown against Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, how far is the Chinese government willing to go to maintain its iron rule? I'm Mehdi Hassan, also on the show. This week, the Trump administration announced that it no longer considers Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank to be a violation of international law. But is there any basis for making such a controversial claim? That's our debate. But first, enemies of the people. That's what Hong Kong's chief executive called protesters who have been demanding greater freedom from Beijing. So is the violence there about to escalate further? And what's the future for China's Uyghurs? This week's headliner, leading pro-government Chinese commentator and former interpreter to the late President Deng Xiaoping, Victor Gao. Victor Gao, thank you for joining me on Upfront. We're almost six months into protests that have rocked Hong Kong, and police repression seems to be escalating by the day. Just last week, a student was shot in the stomach by a police officer, while the Chinese-backed chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, declared the protesters enemies of the people. Are you OK with how China and how Chinese-backed authorities in Hong Kong have handled these protests? No, first of all, everyone can see with his or her own eyes that violence has been committed on a massive scale, arson attacks on police officers, attacks on public order, sabotage of transportation, uh, all this uh, is happening as we speak. And Hong Kong, as a democracy, protects the people's rights to protest and demonstrate. But they need to do that in a legal manner. Illegal gathering is a crime in Hong Kong. And attacks on innocent people is a crime to be punished by the law. Therefore, I think we all have great confidence in the Hong Kong SAR government, in the Hong Kong police. They have a job to do. They need to do whatever they can allow by the law to bring law and order back to Hong Kong. Law and order, yes, but also human rights. Multiple human rights groups, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have denounced the use of excessive force against the protesters. Even the UN human rights chief, Michelle Bachelet, has called for an independent investigation into the violence. Uh, presumably, you support such an investigation to clear China's good name. Now, first of all, um, human rights are always important in Hong Kong as well as in any other society. However, no human rights will give any reason to anyone to commit crime or to commit violence. Therefore, let's keep these two separate. Yes, and but the, police but the argument is authorized is that the to use Hong Kong force. police are using violence excessively. So do you support a UN investigation to work out what's going on on the ground? Come on, if violence of this kind, which happened in Hong Kong, happens in any other city in the world, I think the police will do their job to, to use whatever force necessary to restore law and order. Hong Kong police, compared with their counterparts in many other cities in the world, are very well disciplined, very civilized, if I may use that word, and I don't think they use excessive force. They are being believed as being too timid or too polite in dealing with mounting you violence. Say, you say too violence timid in Hong and Kong too is polite. a fact. What about the case of Simon Cheng, a Hong Kong citizen who worked at the British consulate, was detained by the Chinese authorities without charge for 15 days. He says he was physically and mentally tortured. He was hooded. Uh, later, he was released without charge and had to flee abroad, fearing for his own life. If that's what happens to employees of Western governments in Chinese custody, what on earth happens to ordinary Hong Kong citizens when you round them up? More than 5,000 of them have been detained since the protests began. Have you really seen his confession? He confessed to soliciting prostitution in Shenzhen. Hold on, wouldn't you confess to all sorts of crimes if you were hung while blindfolded, hooded, handcuffed, shackled, had your knees, joints beaten with spiked buttons? Wouldn't you admit to any crime? With due respect to you, I think that gentleman committed a crime in China punishable by law. And that is a fact. And you need to talk to him about whether he committed the crime, rather than accusing China without any found reason on the television. He says he went through this torture. You're saying he's lying. 
He's lying because he confessed his confession was now in the public domain. Everyone in the world, everyone, every news agency in the world can get direct access to his confession, acknowledging that he committed a crime in China. Okay, but, he need to be punished, but, sir. But, but most confessions obtained under torture don't count. Is there a risk that the Chinese military is going to directly intervene on the ground in Hong Kong? Because you have Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping saying just a few weeks ago that, quote, anyone attempting to split China in any part of the country will end in crushed bodies and shattered bones. That's pretty stark rhetoric. Do you get why so many people are worried that there might be another Tiananmen Square massacre, but this time in Hong Kong, given such rhetoric about shattered bones? Whatever political perspective you adopt, one thing is sure, that is, law and order need to be restored in Hong Kong. And law and order need to be restored in Hong Kong through whatever legal means possible. A Chinese so military intervention? if the Hong Kong police cannot do their job, if the Hong Kong police cannot do their job, something else needs to be done. Read the basic law, and the basic law contains provisions about Hong Kong, how Hong Kong SAR government, if they cannot do their job in Hong Kong, need to request assistance from the central government. And the central government has a whole array of things they can do in Hong Kong. Does that include crushing bodies and shattering bones, to quote President Xi Jinping? Listen, and all this is completely in compliance with the one country, two system. Now, when you talk about restoring law and order, look at what the Americans are doing. Look at what the British are doing. We do. Look at the, what the we French do people are doing. On this law show, and order need to be that. restored. We regularly do that on the show, Victor. You know that. You've been on the show before. We cover lots of topics. I'm asking about the shattering of uh, bones and the crushing of bodies, which is the president's quote. Do you support that measure? Sir, look at what the uh, U.S. authorities did in Los Angeles in bringing law and order to the rioting in Los Angeles. And you will know when you US are talking President about restoring law and about order. Crushing of bodies and shattering of bones. Then you read history. History is very plentiful in terms of how law and order need to be restored. No civilized society will tolerate the level of violence as we see in Hong Kong. That's the bottom line. You talk about civilized societies. Uh, Victor Gao, another major story out of China in recent days has been the leaked documents from inside the Chinese government that were published by the New York Times uh, on the situation in Xinjiang with the Uyghur Muslim minority that you and I have discussed on this show and on Head to Head before. Uh, we already knew that anywhere between a million and three million of those Muslims have been locked up in quote-unquote re-education camps. But now we know from these documents that... Number one, responsibility for this goes all the way to the top, to President Xi Jinping himself, uh, who is quoted as calling for absolutely no mercy. And number two, that even some Chinese officials, Victor, were unhappy with the severity of the crackdown on the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Listen, in China, the Chinese people support the government's measures in... Uh, fighting against uh, terrorism, extremism, and separatism. That's the bottom line. No one in China wants to suffer the scourge of terrorism. And we are very happy that over the past three years, there has been no single major terrorist attack happening in China, plaguing on the people of China, preying on innocent life. That's the key. And the Chinese people are happy about that. And Terrorism is a scourge not only in China, but in many other countries in the world. The world needs to be united in fighting against terrorism. I think many countries than... in the world are united against what you call the scourge of terrorism, but they're not all united about the way the Chinese have decided to deal with millions of people, literally. And in fact, as we learn from these documents, many Chinese officials had issues with this too. Uh, Wang Yongji, the Chinese official in charge of one of the counties in Xinjiang, where tens of thousands of Uyghurs were detained, he thought that the orders from central government, according to the New York Times, quote, left no room for moderation and would poison ethnic relations in the country. He ended up freeing over 7,000 inmates, and for that, he was detained, stripped of power, and prosecuted. Sir, with due respect to you, let me suggest, let the Chinese fight against terrorism in China. Let the Americans Is Wang fight Yongji terrorism not Chinese? in America. This was a Communist Party official running a county in Xinjiang who freed Uyghurs and was punished for doing so. Listen, let China fight its terrorism in its own term. 
postponed. Let the Americans fight the terrorism in China with their terms. Well, last time I Let checked, Wang Yongji is not a U.S. Do its citizen. Job Wang Yongji is a Chinese official country. who we learned this week uh, quietly ordered the release of more than 7,000 Uyghurs because he thought it was an excessive policy. He was detained, stripped of power, and prosecuted. Do you support that move against your fellow Chinese uh, citizen? With due respect, let's focus on the main thing. That is fighting against terrorism in China. We need to fight you against terrorism in times, China. So you're very terrorism is a subject. scourge. I've asked you a specific question. Why was a Chinese Communist Party official uh, relieved of his job and punished for freeing Uyghurs if everyone's united against fighting terrorism? Sir, I will mention this 1,000 times it is necessary. The Chinese people have a job to do, that is to fight against terrorism. Okay, you say, I hope you will understand that. I understand. You say they're all terrorists and this is a security measure. But the Chinese government in these leaked documents makes clear that officials were well aware that those locked up in Xinjiang weren't guilty of any crimes. This is the quote. It is just that their thinking has been infected by unhealthy thoughts. So you're locking up people for not committing a crime for having thoughts you don't like. That's pretty Orwellian, Victor Gao. No, I think uh, there are 23 million people in Xinjiang, and I can say with all responsibility that the majority of those people want to have peace from terrorism. And they are united behind the government's measures of fighting against terrorism. Because why? None of them want to suffer the evil forces of terrorism. That's the bottom line. Again, I will repeat this 1,000 times. Let's focus on the daunting, overriding task yes. of fighting against terrorism. Um, That's the main point. Fine. It, you say it's the main point. For people who are being tortured, it might not be the main point. How long can the Chinese government carry on pretending that hundreds and hundreds of Uyghurs around the world who were either detained and tortured themselves and have escaped or have family members back home who have disappeared or been tortured? How long can it continue to pretend that all of these Uyghurs around the world who are raising the alarm bell, who are sounding the alarm bell, that they're all lying to human rights groups, they're all lying to journalists, they're all making it up? How long can you pretend that? So let's fight against terrorism and terrorism committed by whatever person need to be punished. I think in China so we do support, not discriminate so support, against you minorities. You support pulling fingernails out, Victor Gao. You support electric shocks. You support people being sterilized. You support people being electrocuted, having their heads shaved. This is the testimony from Uyghurs who have escaped Xinjiang province. Listen, I support all the legal measures adopted by the Chinese government under Chinese law in order to fight against terrorism. That's the bottom line. Does the Chinese government's legal measures in Xinjiang include pulling out fingernails, electric shocks, the shaving of heads, a chair of nails, sterilization? Is that what you support, the Chinese legal measures in S Xinjiang? Sir you, sir, you are asking misleading questions. No, I'm not. I'm asking you about the I testimony of Uyghurs. I will not fall into Uyghurs. your trap. There's no trap, Victor. I'm literally reading out the quotes from Sairal Sotbai, a Uyghur Muslim teacher who escaped from China, from Zumrat Daoud, uh, who testified in Washington, D.C. this week, uh, from Kairat Samarkan, who says that he was forced to stand in a fixed position for 12 hours. These are fellow Chinese citizens of yours giving their testimony on what happened to them. Are you not concerned? Sir... Sir, there are more than 50 countries, governments, who signed a written statement in support of China's fight against terrorism in Xinjiang. Why don't you read their statements? Why don't you talk to them? Why don't you talk to the Chinese government officials in China doing the very, very important job of fighting against terrorism? Why do you want to pick one side against the majority of the people in China? Why don't you talk to people like me who do not want to suffer the consequences of terrorism in China. Well, let's hold on. be Victor, hold on. very I am talking balanced to you. in your view. I am talking to you. In fact, we've invited you on the show because we appreciate but you coming on. But don't impose your questions on me. Well, I'm not but imposing don't, a question. I'm asking a question. But don't impose your misleading to questions it. to me. You think it's misleading, Victor. I'm literally reading out the quotes from Chinese citizens. Um, and, you know, we've asked Chinese government officials to come on the show. They've refused to come on. So How many people have you talked about? How many people have you talked about? Have you talked to about one point? 4 billion Chinese people? Have you talked to, you want me to the majority of the people China? here in you want China? You me to quote 1.4 billion people to you. I'm quoting to you people who say they've been tortured. If that doesn't bother you, that's your choice. Last question then. According to the New York Times, the leaked that's documents... That's not my choice. That's the choice of more than 50 countries in the world. Fine, fine. They support China's that's policy. That's fine. That's they a legitimate point, and you are right. Many countries do support China's policy. 
That doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean I'm not going to ask you any questions. A final question, though, Victor. Appreciate you taking time out. According to the New York Times, the leaked documents also show that the government has plans to extend restrictions on Islam to other parts of China. Mosques have already been demolished or shut down in multiple provinces. There's been a crackdown on the use of Arabic script in public places. One China scholar recently said that the People's Republic of China has become the world's foremost purveyor of anti-Islamic ideology and hate. What do you say to them? That's completely false. I travel extensively throughout China. I have many friends who are Muslims. Islam is a great religion, and we all need to respect Islam. Go to Ningxia. Go to many parts in Xinjiang. Go with, and see with your own eyes how many mosques are elegantly standing there in front of the people, in front of the believers and non-believers. If anyone believes that China will damage or do ruins to the mosques, they are cheating themselves. They are cheating lie, uh, the whole world. And the truth will be more eloquent than these lies. Victor Gao, thank you for joining me on Upfront. This week, the Trump administration announced that the U.S. would no longer consider Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank a violation of international law, reversing four decades of U.S. government policy. While the Israeli government praised the decision, most countries and the United Nations continue to view settlements as illegal. But when it comes to Israel and the occupied territories, including Gaza, does international law even matter anymore? Or is it just whatever the United States says it is? Joining me to debate this from Ramallah, Omar Shakir, the Director of Human Rights Watch in Israel and Palestine, and here in the studio, Professor Eugene Kontorovich, an international law professor at the George Mason University Scalia Law School and the Israeli think tank, the Kohelet Policy Forum. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Um, Omar, let me start with you. Does this latest US decision to disregard international law and recognize Israeli settlements in the occupied territories make those settlements any less illegal? Will it change the way the rest of the world sees those settlements? The US declaration changes nothing. The Trump administration cannot erase decades of established international law that settlements are a violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention and, in fact, a war crime. And I think this, the range of statements that you referenced from the European Union, from many countries across the world, from the UN, indicate that there is consensus outside of the, this Israeli government and outside of the Trump administration that settlements are illegal. It is as uncontroversial to say settlements are illegal as it is to say that torture is illegal. It is black and white international law. Eugene, do you want to respond to that? It's black and white. It's uncontroversial. Yeah, it's completely wrong. It hasn't even been the policy of the United States since the Reagan administration. Uh, and it's not the policy of the international community. And it's not the policy of Human Rights Watch. And you see that there are Armenian settlers in Nagorno-Karabakh. There's now Turkey is moving millions of people into northern Syria. Morocco me moves people into western Sahara. And in none of these cases has Human Rights Watch or the international community said this violates Article 49.6 of the Geneva Convention. That's not international law. This is a special standard that's been invented to prevent Jews from living in Judea and Samaria. That's absolutely incorrect. Human Rights Watch covers 100 countries across the world. You can look up our reports on Western Sahara, for example. You can look up our reports on Crimea, the same law of occupation that has been in the international system for nearly, you know, for over 70 years is the exact same system that we use here. It's Article 49 of the, Gen of the Geneva Convention. The reality here is Israel doesn't want to play by the same set of rules. Those settlements are built on land stolen from Palestinians that are from there, and settlements are at the core of a two-tiered discriminatory regime that treats Palestinians separately and unequally. And the reality is here the war crime is not the, 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 the uh, settler himself is not a war criminal. The war crime is the act of transfer of a population okay. to territory acquired by war. Eugene, let me just pick up on a substantive issue yeah. you mentioned and Omar mentioned, um, you know, the application to other areas of the world. Uh, Crimea was mentioned. Yes. Uh, Russia has been sanctioned for its invasion and annexation of Crimea. Just last month, the UN Assistant Secretary General went to the General Assembly and said that on the issue of the occupation, he said, it is against the Geneva Conventions for Russia to transfer its population into an occupied area. You say only Israel is being held to that standard. Not true. Uh, Russia invaded Crimea and seized this in a military conflict where it was the aggressor. 
Israel, I must submit, did not take this from another country that owned it. This was not Jordanian with, territory. I understand the argument. Yes. With respect, you're slightly moving the goalposts. You said that no one applies this standard of the Fourth Geneva Convention of moving populations. I'm saying they are applying it in Crimea. Do you recognize it? It has been mentioned by a couple UN reports. The in UN Assistant to, Secretary General yeah, for Human in, Rights in, said in, it last month. In relation to Crimea, they have not been sanctioned for this. They've been sanctioned for the invasion. It's not been applied to Nagorno-Karabakh, Western Cyprus, Western... Uh, but Sahara, it has been applied to Nor Crimea. Northern, uh, they have have mentioned it in regard to Crimea. So the UN has talked about it in the context of Crimea. It's not Israel is not a special case here. There is one other case that does not make. Okay, it's a pretty big one. And, and just on the subject of uh, uh, this idea of stolen Palestinian land, do you want to respond to that point? The idea of that this is, we haven't used the O word yet. Yeah. The whole point about settlements flows from the idea that this is an occupation. What's your response to that? Uh, you can only occupy the territory of another country. That's what Russia did. It invaded what everyone regarded was Ukrainian territory. In 1967, when Israel retook the West Bank, it was not Jordanian territory. Jordan was not the sovereign. It was not, there was no Palestinian state. It's not occupation. As for the idea that all of this land belongs to private Palestinians, it's ridiculous. That's because international organizations refuse to recognize the validity of sales to private Jews. Jews buy land, own land from the 1920s. Would Omar agree that Jews could live in land that has been in private Jewish property since the 1920s? Or does he say there is no such thing as private Jewish property in the West Bank? Omar, do you want to respond to that? Absolutely. Look, Eugene is trying to muck up what is black and white. Eugene is right. There is some land that were owned privately by Jewish families before 1967. But the reality here is Eugene is trying to make complicated what is not. Every country virtually in the world recognizes the uh, West Bank and East Jerusalem. By the way, even this U.S. government to this point, um, can, but every other country in the world considers it to be occupied territory. This is not some matter that needs to, you know, an international law professor to tell you how to read lines in the but Fourth oh, Geneva Convention. But it's Omar, black and white. Omar, let me bring this to you. Hold on, you say it's black and white, but there is a gray area in the case of the, in the West Bank because uh, Eugene makes the point, and a lot of people defending Israel's behavior in that part of the world do make this argument, that the, there was no sovereign power there when the Israelis took it over in 1967. It wasn't, it's not as clear cut as Crimea being part of Ukraine and formal Ukrainian borders. Is that fair right. or no? The exact, same, the exact same United Nations mechanism that set out the creation of Israel set out the creation of a separate political entity that would be a Palestinian state uh, that was supposed to be on 45 percent of the land. And of course, we know what happened as a result of the conflict. But the reality is the same international legal apparatus that led to the creation of the state of Israel is the same bodies that have not only set out the creation of a separate entity, but also have continuously reaffirmed, including at the Security Council in 2016 and 2234, the illegality of settlements as a matter of consensus international law. OK, let me bring Eugene to respond to that. Yeah, so uh, international law, any system of law, you work, it works by figuring out what the rule is by looking at how it's applied otherwise. If I'm a lawyer in a yeah. case, I'm going to cite nine other okay. cases to see what the Fine. law is. You made and that you point. And we've talked about the other examples. You've said there are examples that don't and count. And that's how you figure out what I the rule is. I pointed out examples. Just on the occupation thing, you, you don't believe there's an occupation. For sure, for two reasons. By, under the terms of the State Department's own memo, yeah. the State Department con concluded that while the territory wasn't Jordan's, it was Jordan's enough to trigger the law okay. of occupation. But, why do said, we... but if there's a peace treaty with Jordan, then there'll be no okay. occupation. There's but why do we need the State Department or Mike Pompeo or Donald Trump's legal expertise when we have the Israeli Supreme Court saying in 2005 the Judea and Samaria areas are held by the State of Israel in belligerent occupation? The military command in the area is not the sovereign in the territory held in belligerent occupation. The Israeli Supreme Court says it's a belligerent occupation. Yeah, so it's a common misstatement to say that the Israeli Supreme Court has adopted this position. Uh, I didn't say the, that. I said the Israeli yes. Supreme Court said it's a belligerent occupation. That's correct. So th that is not exactly accurate, but it's not accurate at all, because what the Israeli, what the Israeli government has done, uh, and it's a little complicated legally, yeah. is they have voluntarily said we're going to apply part of the law of belligerent occupation to the territories as a matter of discretion, just like uh, the Bush administration applied parts of the Geneva Con Convention to Guantanamo or saying it doesn't apply. So when the Israeli Supreme Court says they're applying the framework of uh, occupation, they mean as an administrative matter because... And when, and when Ariel Sharon, who wasn't exactly yeah. a friend of the Palestinians, when he said, you may not like the word, but what's happening is occupation. Holding 3.5 million Palestinians under occupation is a bad thing for Israel. What, Should we trust him or Mike Pompeo? What's great is that Israel is a democracy. 
And it's irrelevant to what no, I no, just no, said. No, I'll, I'll explain. In the, people express many different political people, views. The Prime Minister yeah. of Israel, perhaps Israel's most famous... Politicians pro- express many different views, unlike with the Palestinians, okay. where there's only one view. Okay. And I would say you can trust views that come so, out of us. So, you, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just need to finish. You, you, hold on. Uh, Omar, let me come back in. I just need to deal with this. Ariel Sharon, the yeah. former Prime Minister of Israel, perhaps Israel's most famous lawyer. politician. not a but he was the prime minister of the but government, ma- which, which so, you said applies. So if you trust Israeli prime ministers, br- yeah. Prime Minister it's Netanyahu says there is no occupation. Okay, and I'm so if you're holding by Matthew, Israeli prime ministers... I'm just wondering why lost. Sean said that. We're getting, because he was trying to achieve lost. a political goal. Lost a little bit. Justifying the withdrawal in Gaza. We're, we're getting lost a little bit here in the word occupation. Look at what Eugene's trying to tell you. On one hand, he's telling you it's not an occupation. Yeah. Okay, let's say Eugene's right. Let's by, by, let's say we throw out everything, uh, you know, the consensus opinion in the world. That means that Israel rules over millions of Palestinians that have no ability to vote, so have no political rights. They cannot move freely, while Israeli Jews who live in the exact same territory are citizens of the state with full free movement, with full political rights, okay. with full civil rights, with full access us to water and electricity. Eugene wants his cake and eats it too. He wants to call Israel democracy, but then say that it is there's no occupation, so Israel's a sovereign, meaning your okay. rules over oh, millions of Palestinians. You made the no point. Rights. Let Eugene come back. You're having uh, your cake and eat it. It's not occupation, but you don't give these people any rights. Omar wants to have his cake and eat it too, because in the Golan in eastern Jerusalem, where the residents can vote, where everyone can vote and is eligible for citizenship, there he doesn't feel that's any better. Where Israel said, okay, you, everyone here can become a citizen. We're formally applying Israeli law in full. There, the international community and Human Rights Watch say that's even worse if you give them a right to vote. Omar, Eugene, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.